Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Business of Sports. The business of sports can be intimidating or hard for a startup to break into. We really appreciate when our owners are actually there, you know, with us through the journey. Teams, ours especially, have been very intentional to diversify at all levels of the company. I think we're in the golden years for the NFL and college football. Our demographic reach has continued to expand. This is going to be really unlocking the streaming platform for sports fans. Sports valuations are rising. We'll see when they peak. You don't have to be the best in your sport to make a whole ton of money. Bloomberg Business of Sports from Bloomberg Radio. This is the Bloomberg Business of Sports show where we explore the big money issues in the world of sports. I'm Damian Sassauer. Michael Barr is out this week and Scarlett Fu is on assignment. But fear not because on the lineup today, Business of Sports reporter Vanessa Perdomo will be joining me to speak with four-time NBA champion, Hall of Famer, Tony Parker, along with the president of Alibaba.com, Kuo Zhang, the basketball point guard legend turned entrepreneur, will front Alibaba.com's campaign, same player, new game, for the summer games in Paris. We'll get his take on his relationship with the e-commerce giant, the global balance of power in the NBA, and more. I always prepare myself during my career. You know, I had some great advice and one of the best ones was Magic Johnson. You know, he he told me, you know, build uh, your network uh, while you're playing, while you're active, because if you wait when you retire, people forget about you real fast. Plus, a story of redemption with the fastest woman on the planet. Our Scarlet Fu and Bloomberg News Romaine Bostic sits down with former Olympic medalist, Marion Jones on moving on from scandal and how her imprisonment marked a new beginning for her life and career. But first, Sony has struck a deal to become the NFL's official technology and headphones partner in a multi-year deal for the league. For more on this, we're joined by none other than Bloomberg U.S. sports reporter Randall Williams. Randall, welcome to the business of sports. I need to ask you this first and foremost. It looks like Sony's done a deal with the NFL on headsets. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And yeah, the NFL has a new headphones partner, a new tech partner in Sony. Sony will begin producing these headphones in 2025. I asked if they're going to be able to, if people are going to be able to buy these things. And they said they wouldn't answer me. Um, Not at this (laughs) moment, which I would guess means. Yes, at some point. Um, but yeah, they have a new tech partner. The Sony's also going to be uh, testing some tech on the sidelines where they're going to be trying electronic first down. So oh, wow. the chain gang could be extinct in the next couple of years. Wow. And is that the, now that's that Hawkeye technology, yeah? Correct. And so what else can that be used for? Is that a, like, is there potential for that type of technology over time to reduce the reliance on officiating? I think so. I think that's, or, or I'd say, it would it'll help with precision for calls for different things like that. But you know, sports nowadays are all about pace of play. And if you can have a tech, if you're gonna have a put a chip in a ball or whatever the tech is going to do with the first down markers, that's going to allow officials to just place the ball right down, for, especially for two minute drills and things like that. I, I'm sure the NFL is gonna want to do that. And it's another sponsorship opportunity that I would guess again that Sony would take over. So that will be maybe another seventy five million, maybe another hundred million, million excuse me, hundred million, fifty million, who knows? So what else are are you know they looking to do in the future that that Sony is looking to innovate or that people in the NFL really want technology to start taking a hold of, do you think? Well, let's see, officiating, and then one of the things that they have, I can't remember the name of the title of the program that helps produce the uh, Toy Story broadcast that happened earlier this year, but Sony helps with that as well. And so if you remember that alternate broadcast on Disney+, Toy Story Fun Day Football. Yes, yes, Toy Story Fun Day Football. Then I think that we could see more of those, maybe not just with Toy Story. The NFL has a lot of partners out there that have rights over a lot of different entertainment franchises. You think of ESPN with Marvel, with uh, some of the other Disney characters. You think of Fox, who used to have X-Men. Um, so there's a lot of different opportunities out there that I think Sony can help assist with, which is why this partnership is so valuable. So you, you're, you're going to be looking at coaches on, this headline, on, on the sidelines. They're going to have on their headphones, it's going to say Sony along the side. I guess that's one of the big draws there. But, you know, 
talk to us about, you know, some of these other big technology providers like Apple. I see a lot of athletes on the sidelines with their iPads looking at, you know, films and footage right after the plays. The you Microsoft know, tablets. Apple, the Microsoft yeah. tablets. So so is that a different, it, that doesn't fall under this now, does it? They are the official tablet. And I, so I made sure to ask about that because the NFL does have a lot of tech partnerships. Right. Sony is the official tech partner. Now, if you see a Microsoft tablet, it'll say the, this is the official tablet of the NFL. So the NFL has different ways. They figured out there's these different terms to make money. Sony, I would say, now the NFL would never say one partner is over the other. But when you say official tech partner versus official tablet, tablet is tech. So Sony reigns supreme. So let's let's switch gears a little bit and let's start talking about the NBA and Vegas. I mean, this is this is such a hot topic. When we were there for the Super Bowl, people were talking to us about it already. It's not even a thing yet, and it's still already set to be the most expensive U.S. sports franchise in history. Talk to us about that and what the deal is going to look like. Yeah, I think eventually. if you go back a couple of years ago, Adam, Sil- someone, a journalist had asked Adam Silver or floated the idea of a $2.5 billion expansion fee, and he said that was a little small. Well, you look at the valuations right now, and an average NBA team is worth around $4 billion, and so that's where it starts. I'd say the $4 billion price tag. Now, you have a new media deal, which allows the NBA to revalue its teams. But Vegas is a goldmine market. The only thing that's missing there is an NBA team. They have a WNBA team. They have an NFL team and the MLS as well. But they have the A's coming, maybe. Um, so there is there is a big opportunity there. But there's a lot of questions as to how the team is going to be able to be there and if the NBA goes there. Now, everyone that I've spoken to has said it's pretty much a foregone conclusion that the NBA is going to choose Las Vegas and Seattle. Obviously, that is to be determined. But one of the questions is, will they play in T-Mobile Arena? Because T-Mobile Arena, who I've spoken to a number of times this year, has said, hey, we're going to make this available for an NBA team should someone want to play here. But are you going to want to split time with the UFC and the and the Vegas Golden Knights? Or are you going to want to build a brand new stadium? If you build a brand new stadium, that's another billion and a half to two billion dollars. I mean, you look at any other stadium out there, the Clippers new arena is a two billion dollar stadium, another one point five billion on top of the expansion fee. And if it's as competitive as what everyone's saying, then four billion dollars is just a floor. You're going to have people who are going to be like, ah, four point two, four point four, similar to how car car work. Randall, I mean, you're closer to this than just about anyone. Who is sniffing around for one of those expansion franchises? I've heard LeBron James. I've heard the Red Bull uh, uh, organization, the consumer good company out of Europe. Talk to us about who you think is sniffing around and who has a pretty good shot of getting a team in Las Vegas and or Seattle. Any billionaire that wants to be in sports that does not own a team is going to want this Vegas team. Now, obviously, LeBron is the biggest name in this. He hasn't been shy. The Redbird Capital Partners, uh, Jerry Cardin- Cardin- right. yeah, Cardinale has not been shy about Fenway saying. Fenway Sports. Is Fenway there. Sports. They are going, I, I believe they are going to bid based on everything that LeBron has said. Now, there's some tricky math to play when LeBron retires because of the fact that he can't be a player and owner at the same time. Um But, you know, the expansion process takes several years for them to decide some of these things. So I think it'll work out. Shaq has said he wants to be involved. We were told that Red Bull is considering these things. So there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be involved in this bid. Now, the Seattle one is a little different because there's a there's a stadium downtown. Uh, I believe her name is Samantha Holloway owns that stadium. It makes sense there. Do you think, though, that Randall, um, you said the owners of that stadium will be the ones who end up getting Seattle? Or do you think that one of these these billionaires who are bidding on uh, Vegas, if they lose out, they're going to start bidding for Seattle? Too? I doubt it. I mean, it's it's possible, but I doubt it because the real estate around Seattle, the real estate everywhere is expensive. But when you have something that's easy for the league, someone who's experienced running a team, it's going to be very, very difficult. The price would have to be astronomical for a billionaire. Let's say this is theory, but let's say Jeff Bezos just wants the team in Seattle and the $4 billion is the floor. Well, they already have a stadium. So let's say Samantha Holloway bids for $4 billion and goes to 4.2, but then Jeff Bezos jumps in and says, I want to go for $6 billion. Well, that's including a stadium. It's just going to be a lot of money that a lot of people don't have. Uh, so I think it's, it's easier for the NBA, if they choose Seattle, to go to her and be like, this is makes perfect sense. And Vegas is different. You, you're going to have some people with, I'd say, much bigger egos who don't want to share an arena. So there's levels to this, and there are some other cities out there, Mexico City, Nashville, maybe Kansas City, that uh, you know are going to be competitive too, but Vegas is the gold mine here that everyone's going to be competing for. 
let's let's talk more about you know the expansion cities that aren't necessarily a lock. Mexico City. If you expand into Mexico and have another partner, another team outside of the U.S., what does that do? Do you think? Well, I think it establishes a base there. Like you know, you think about all these big sports leagues. No, there's of the big leagues, the NFL, the NBA, and the MLB. None of them are in Mexico City yet, but the first one is going to be a winner there. I mean, that's the reason why NBA plays there. The NFL plays there consistently. Now, the NFL hasn't been there in some time because the stadium that they play in is under construction for the World Cup. But, uh, you know, the first team to get there is going to be a big deal. Randall, I mean, we know that, you know, we can't even be talking expansion in the NBA without them having first, uh, you know, nailed down this $76 billion 11-year contract with with all these different companies from Walt Disney to Comcast to Amazon. We had a little bit of a breakthrough, if I'm not mistaken, just uh, a few days back where, you know, officially Warner Brothers Discovery was uh, w- was spurned. So can yeah. you just give us a little update on that? I know that's been something you've been covering very closely. Yeah, the NBA chose Amazon. I, I never expected them to go back to Warner Brothers Discovery Warner Brothers Discovery CEO uh, David Zaslov has said, hey, we don't need the NBA two years ago. And so that was, I'd say, the beginning of a fracture in a relationship. Why would someone say that about a relationship that's ongoing? That's like you being in a relationship and saying, yeah, my wife's great, but I don't need her. Like, you know, that's that's essentially what happened. And so the league is looking for a fresh start and they wanted a streaming partner in Amazon. They got one. Now Warner Brothers Discovery offered to say, hey, we'll, we'll simulcast our games on Max and on TNT. The league said, no, we don't want that. So Warner Brothers Discovery obviously is suing and saying, hey, you know, you're you're contractually obligated for us to win this based on the matching rights. But the interesting thing is that Warner Brothers Discovery is paying $1.4 billion right now. The Amazon deal is worth roughly $1.8 billion over the course of 11 years, which is like $19 million over the lifetime of it. Warner Brothers right now has the B package. They are bidding for the C package. So they didn't want to pay the package that they lost because NBC has the B package. Right. They wanted to pay Amazon's package. Well, why would you want to pay a, get a, what some would say, a lesser package because they're being cheap. Amazon offered to pay uh, the first three years in cash, like $5.4 billion in cash where they're like, hey, here it is. Take care of it. Warner Brothers Discovery had to get a um, a, a credit loan. So yeah, well, there's I, levels to this. Randall Williams, U.S. sports business reporter here for Bloomberg News, our own. Randall, thank you for joining us here on the Bloomberg Business of Sports. Appreciate you for having me. Coming up, Former Olympic champion Marion Jones reflects on her conviction and her story of redemption. That's straight ahead on the Bloomberg Business of Sports show from Bloomberg Radio around the world. Bloomberg Radio is on Amazon Alexa. Get live business news 24 hours a day anywhere you have an Alexa device. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg Radio. You're listening to Bloomberg Business of Sports from Bloomberg Radio. Welcome back to the Bloomberg Business of Sports show, where we explore the big money issues in the world of sports. I'm Damian Sassauer. Michael Barr is off this week, and Scarlett Fu is on assignment. She was once considered the fastest woman in the world and won gold at the 2000 Summer Olympics in Sydney, Australia. But in 2008, things turned for Marion Jones when she was sentenced to six months in prison after pleading guilty to lying to federal investigators over her use of performance-enhancing drugs, stripping her of five medals in the process. Here, the former Olympic gold medalist is now gearing up for her second chance. For more, our Scarlet Food joins Romaine Bostic to sit down with Marion Jones. Let's listen in. Marion, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, it's thank great you. to see you here. Thank you. At the Sydney Games, you were the fastest woman on the planet. You won five medals, three golds, two bronzes. Before things came crashing down, mm-hmm. um, you ended up pleading guilty for lying to federal investigators over using banned substances. You gave up your medals and you spent six months in prison in 2008. So that is an incredible personal journey. It's gone through highs and lows. How has it changed your understanding of failure? It's totally changed it. Um, An incredible experience. We chatted a moment ago about if I was watching the games and so many people are um, interested in that, if I watch it with joy, and I do, my experiences there were positive. 
um, and my experiences there um, were life-changing also. Um, but not only my experience after the games and the poor choices that I made and the severe consequences that I faced, um, but it's also, I think, says something about like grit in that, you know, people necessarily cannot relate to being an Olympic champion, nor then can they relate to going to the Olympics. They can't, many can't relate to being a convicted felon, but everybody can relate to some type of failure in their life. Mm -hmm whether it's a failure in their career, in their relationships, financial failure. Um, and what I've learned from mine is that it's thankfully not forever. We don't have to stay there. Being stuck is a choice. Um, and even bigger than I think all of that is this idea that your setbacks in life don't have to be um, forever and your comeback can be that much bigger and better. In the startup world and among entrepreneurs, failure isn't always seen as a bad thing. It can be a good thing. Um, it's valued and it's encouraged. It's seen as a way of uh, learning from your mistakes. It's a positive experience. You clearly have made peace with it. What were the steps that you needed to take to get to that mindset? Well, you know, while I was in it, it was hard. Um, but I think what really helped me was this idea of pausing while I was in the midst of my discomfort. And that's what I share with entrepreneurs now that I coach and then I mentor in that. Um, the discomfort is something that you have to embrace, whether it's in life, whether it's in business. Um, you find your steps to success in the midst of your discomfort. Um, but while you're in it, or while I was in it at least, just sitting and pausing, reflecting on choices that I had made, on where I was, but more importantly, where I was headed, um, the, making the decision to reframe and reinvent myself and how I was gonna do that. And then lastly, preparing oneself for hiccups along the way. Mm -hmm. Like after my time away, the consequences that I face, um, I knew that doors were going to be slammed in my face and people wouldn't want to hear from me and opportunities would not be there. And if I wasn't prepared to push through that, knowing that I had a testimony to share, I had things that I wanted to teach people, um, regardless if at that time the world wanted to hear from me and I knew my time would come um, when I was ready. I made the choice after all that happened to step away from the spotlight for over a decade, mm -hmm. my priorities were my three kids and making sure that they were healthy and ready for the world. Um, and also me, I, I needed to step away mm -hmm. and, and find where I was headed. Um, and over the past few years, in preparation for all this, I knew that the story, my story was one that I wanted to help people. Ultimately, sports opened up the door for me and mm -hmm. gave me opportunities. It's one of the things that I share with athletes now. Mm -hmm. um, enjoy the moment, embrace it, trust the process. They worked hard to get there, but also understand that sport, uh, life is bigger than sport. Surround yourself with people that will help you grow and prepare for after sport. Mm -hmm. Talk about why you came back into the mm -hmm. spotlight. You say you basically kind of disappeared yourself mm -hmm. uh, for about a decade. You're back in the spotlight now. Why? Oh, it was my moment. Mm -hmm. I think that all of us go through seasons in our life, um, seasons of regret, seasons of joy, seasons of success. Um, and I needed, as I shared, to pause mm -hmm. and to focus on what was important in my world. This is the time for me. Um, I have partnered with an incredible company whereby we teach entrepreneurs the tools on how to come back from failure. You're talking about the company Driven. Correct. Uh, explain exactly what Driven does and more importantly for those folks who are interested in it, what exactly are they gonna get by being on that platform? Well, well Driven Inc. is a company that was formed by Suzanne Evans um, a while back. Suzanne Evans is a best-selling author, New York Times best-selling author. We partnered earlier in the year. She coaches and mentors entrepreneurs. And I have a passion for physical movement. I'm also a trainer. I have been for over a decade. And this idea of balancing the body, the mindset, and your belief system in a way that entrepreneurs can really step out of their comfort zone and, and get closer to success. And it's something that we do. I, I train people. 
um, entrepreneurs. I mean, because everybody, especially as we age, we all know it's important. Movement is important. It's, it, it helps the brain, it helps the body, it helps the heart. Um, and it's something that I'm absolutely passionate about. So how did this come together, this partnership mm -hmm. with Suzanne and Driven? Was it through the entrepreneurs that you were training and this idea that, oh, wait, leadership and overcoming challenges, there is something in common here, or did Suzanne approach you? No, I, well, the this, this story is very interesting. At the beginning of the month, at the beginning of the year, um, Suzanne was in town. I'm from the Austin, Texas area. We have a mutual friend. The mutual friend said, hey, Suzanne, I have a, a personal trainer that I would like for you to meet. And I met Suzanne, we worked out together, we trained together, and, and really we just bonded in a way that we knew that my story, my journey, this idea of coming back from hardship applies to everybody. Every single human, um, if you're being honest with yourself, is coming back from something. Yeah. And really need the tools on how to do that, especially entrepreneurs. Well said. So in your prime, um, you talked about the opportunities you had. You had endorsements, deals with Nike, with Gatorade. Um, I know you wore a white mustache for the Got Milk <laughs> campaign. Were those relationships uh, severed permanently? I mean, now that you're back in the spotlight again, is this something that you're looking to renew, to resuscitate? No, I, I, I'm in a, absolutely like I shared before. I'm in a different place in my world. Um, and opportunities are opening up that are very different from what they look like before. Ultimately, ultimately, my goal is to help people, right? And the platform that I have now and the opportunities that have opened themselves up um, will allow me to do that. And what comes out of that, we don't know. Um, but as long as I have put together a team around me, and that's a big part of it, an accountability team, right? People who will help you along the way and give it to you straight. As long as I keep that team around me and ultimately my goal is to help people, we'll see what comes about it all. How do you approach then dealing with the media? I mean, when you go back to the early part of your career as an athlete, of course, you know how vicious the media cycle can be when it wants to be here. You're now reentering that spotlight to a certain extent here. Are you better prepared to handle that? I, I am. I mean, that's experience and, and age mm -hmm. and time and growth. Um, but it's, it's hard when you're 22 years old and, you know, you're, the, the, you're on the cover of Vogue magazine and every magazine cover. Um, I was prepared as I could have been mm -hmm. at that age. Um, but now I'm certainly at a place whereby my story has been well documented and discussed and I have shared certain things and I have faced consequences and I'm pretty much done with it, right? Like I understand there are certain things that need to be said, but if it's all at this point not about forward movement, mm -hmm. which is how I like to relate to my clients, even in your business, it's about moving forward. Poor choices were made, everybody, right? Um, but if you stay there stuck in that place, there's no room for growth. Mm -hmm. And so that is how I've actually mm -hmm. applied my strategy towards the media, okay. that it needs to be forward movement. I, I am not interested in things in the past. Right. Like if, if you are, just Google things, right? Like there's a lot of information there. I've said what I had to say, um, and I hope people now are, you know, Generally, the, the, the consensus is people want to know where I'm at and what I'm doing moving forward, and I'm all about that. And that strategy, that mm -hmm. ethos, that translates into, say, entrepreneurs and the other folks who are going to be using the Driven platform? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's what we teach. Um, we also teach it's important to, as I've shared, right, like assess where you're at, where you were, why you made certain choices. And once you come to that, then it's time to push past it and move forward and make a plan. Mm -hmm. So I have one final question for you. Let's say Elon Musk comes over to you and is in need of some personal training uh, of the mind, <laughs> not just physically, uh, although maybe where, that where is he's, this uh, <laughs> he's in Texas, you're in Texas. Okay. <laughs> you're oh, working oh with entrepreneurs. Uh, what would you say to him? What would be a piece of advice you'd give to him? I, I mean, I think it would be similar to what I share with the athletes right? Um, that the platform that you have is for a season, right? And the lives that you can impact negatively and positively will ultimately be what you're remembered as and who you're remembered as. And I think if you really, really sit back and look in the mirror and that, um, 
Yeah, it would be easier to embrace it all. That was Marion Jones speaking with our Scarlet Foo and Romaine Bostic. Up next on the show, we speak with French-American former four-time NBA champion Tony Parker, along with the president of Alibaba.com, Kuo Zhang, on their partnership for the Summer Games in Paris. For me, it's a, it's a big honor, you know, to, to partner with Alibaba on a very uh, uh, important subject you know, for us as athletes. Uh, what we're going to do uh, after our career, it can be very uh, scary. You know, a lot of athletes, you know, we, we've been doing the same thing for like 20, 30, 40 years, and then we have to retire and we have to think about the afterlife. And so uh, what, what they put together, Alibaba, with that business accelerator uh, is just to, to educate and help uh, athletes uh, to be more efficient, you know, with a business. That's straight ahead on the Bloomberg Business of Sports. I'm Damien Sassauer, along with Vanessa Perdomo, and this is Bloomberg. With the Bloomberg Small Business Report, I'm Dan Schwartzman. As electronic payment methods such as Zelle, Venmo, and Cash App continue to gain popularity, the question becomes, will the government regulate it as a U.S. Senate committee debated how to characterize the free service? Small businesses continue to rely on the payment methods as peer-to-peer payments globally hit $2.7 trillion last year, with projections saying that amount could reach over $8 trillion by 2030. As electronic wallet thefts increase to the tune of $370 million just with Zelle, the government is deciding who is responsible when electronic wallets are targeted by fraudsters. Banks argue that the payments made electronically are no different than cash, while others say that they're more like credit or debit card transactions, which have more protections. With those added protections, though, come fees, which could limit profits for small businesses. That's your Bloomberg Small Business Report. You're listening to Bloomberg Business of Sports from Bloomberg Radio. This is the Bloomberg Business of Sports show, where we explore the big money issues in the world of sports, I'm Damian Sassauer, along with Business of Sports reporter Vanessa Perdomo. From the Summer Games in Paris, Michael Barr's off this week and Scarlett Fu is on assignment. The Summer Games in Paris are still underway and it's been no doubt a amazing, amazing event. Earlier this month, we learned that Olympian and four-time NBA champion Tony Parker was named the face of Alibaba.com at this year's Games. And we are talking about it with Tony Parker and... Kuo Zhang, president of Alibaba.com. Gentlemen, welcome to the Bloomberg Business of Sports. Thank you, Damien. Thanks for having us. So you are in Paris now, and I'm going to begin with you, Kuo. What I'd really love for you to talk about, I know AI has been a big theme for Alibaba during this Olympics. Uh, I would love to hear a little bit more about Wonder Avenue, about the Champs-Élysées showcase. Talk to us a little bit about the role AI is having in transforming not just the Olympics themselves, but the broadcast and distribution of this year's Olympics? Uh, actually, for the revenue numbers that we cannot give you kind of exact number now, but I can see that there's a lot of a boost of sales in the kind of uh, Olympic around the uh, equipment. Like people buy a lot of uh, TVs, projectors, and all the kind of uh, screens that to enjoy the game. I think that's one, and also all the accessories around the sports. And you know, we we uh, sponsor Olympics for uh, at least more than seven years now, and we started from uh, two thousand uh, twenty seventeen. And the, the first that the Alibaba Group is helping to transform Olympics into the digital area. And for this year, actually, we are working together with IOCs to help to transform the athlete into the entrepreneurs in the digital area as well. So that's why that we are sitting here with uh, Tony and uh, with LC, with Olympic, and to see that how we can use our technology and the business support to help the athletes here after their professional career. Yeah, exactly. I would love to, you know, get your take on that, Tony, you know, with this partnership and and having Alibaba there now supporting athletes and that this Athlete 365 initiative where, you know, athletes are really thinking about their career and transition. How important do you think that is and how significant is that for especially Olympic athletes who not everyone has like these million dollar sponsorships? Yeah, Vanessa, it's, it's huge. Uh, and uh, for me, it's a, it's a big honor, you know, to, to partner with Alibaba 
on a very uh, uh, important subject you know, for us as athletes. Uh, what we're going to do uh, after our career, it can be very uh, scary. You know, a lot of athletes, you know, we've been doing the same thing for like 20, 30, 40 years. And then we have to retire and we have to think about the afterlife. And so uh, what, what they put together, Alibaba, with that business accelerator uh, is just to, to educate and help uh, athletes uh, to be more efficient, you know, with a business and uh, anything they want to do, you know, you have to st start with a passion. You know, you have to be passionate about something, and uh, and, and then uh, put in the work. And uh, it's hard sometimes. You don't know when, where to start, and how to do it. And uh, and so that program, uh, the business Ac accelerator, is definitely going to help you uh, uh, and be successful in business. And is the main reason why I wanted to to do that partnership. And uh, I'm very glad that we're doing it. You know, I have my academy in Paris and we're going to do a lot of stuff with uh, Alibaba. And, and the main thing is to to help our athletes have a great, uh, a great future and a, a great life uh, after their sports career. Well, Tony, for our audience, I wonder if you could, you know, share a little bit about your experiences after the NBA. I know you're a majority owner in French basketball team, Asville Basket. I know yes. at one point you were a 3% owner of the Seattle Reign. I mean, talk to us a little bit about those experiences and how, how that's kind of helped prepare you for what you're doing today. But my parents did a great job to always tell me, you know, a sports career can be very short. Uh, you know, the average in NBA is, is five years. I was very blessed, you know, to play uh, 22 seasons as a professional basketball player. But I always prepare myself during my career. You know, I had some great advice. And one of the best ones was Magic Johnson. You know, he, he told me, you know, build uh, your network uh, while you're playing, while you're active. Because if you wait when you retire, people forget about you real fast. <laughs> and that's what I did uh, while I was playing. I was uh, creating my network and go to dinners with different CEOs. And I was being a sponge and, and learning a lot. And I invest in that basketball team uh, very early. I was 27 when I invest in the team. I bought the men's team. I bought the women's team. And then I built the academy. Uh, and then I created uh, my group. And so I was very, very active. And uh, uh, that's why I didn't really feel that depression when I retired. Actually, I had one more year left in my contract when I retired. And I called uh, Michael Jordan, who was my boss at the time. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do my last year. I was excited. I was looking forward uh, to the business and I really enjoying my life right now. It's been five years and I'm retired and it, it's been uh, unbelievable. Mr. Zhang, I want to come back to you and talk a little bit about Alibaba and their role at the Olympics this year. Uh, we know, you know, Chairman Zhou Tsai also himself is an owner of, uh, you know, professional sports franchises like the Brooklyn Nets and the New York Liberty. You know, talk to us about, you know, Alibaba's role, not just at the Olympics, but more broadly speaking in sports globally. You know, what role do you foresee Alibaba playing, you know, in the world of professional sports going forward? I started from this kind of accident, uh, Series X5. So uh, before we kind of start this kind of program, we do a lot of surveys. Actually, we ask around 400 former athletes from US and from UK about their stories, about their plans. And we, we figure that the athletes and the successful entrepreneurs actually have many things in common, like passion, Tony just mentioned, like a resilience, discipline, push the boundary, go oriented. Actually, these kind of things actually the characteristic that successful entrepreneurs should have. And we already have a lot of successful case on Alibaba.com, who is using Alibaba.com as a platform to sourcing, to find partners, or to sell, or to resell product. So that's why that we want to extend this kind of uh, support this uh, Olympic, with IOCs to get more and more kind of uh, athletes attracted to this uh, digital business area. And we believe that these athletes, if they are successful, are going to be super impact in the business world as well, since they are the leading examples to the youth and the leading example to the younger generation. And since they are successful, we prove that anybody can be successful on Alibaba.com. And that's our kind of uh, mission to make it easy to do business anywhere. So that's why we have passion to kind of uh, sponsor this program. And we believe that together that we can give athletes a better transition after their professional uh, career in sports. Tony, switching back to you, you know, I just have to ask you this question. You know, you mentioned Magic Johnson, you mentioned Michael Jordan, these NBA greats. You know, I know I mean, you played with Tim Duck, Duncan, Big Shot Rob, you know these names. I mean, I'm sure you still keep in touch with many of them, but when you're in bed alone at night, 
do you and, and you're laying awake there? I mean, who is the point guard that you had to face up against? I just have to ask you that that kept you up at night. Is it Jason Kidd? Is it Steve Nash? I mean, who do you still think about although these many years later after you've retired? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I think for me and my generation, uh, it was more like you said, Jason Kidd, Steve Nash, Chris Paul. That was the top three that I was battling uh, every year to to try to be the, the best point guard in NBA. And so I was very lucky. It was a golden uh, era because then, uh, you know, Steph Curry arrived and uh, Russell Westbrook and yep. you have a lot of great point guards uh, when I was playing. Last question for you, Kuo. I mean, we know Alibaba is the big elephant in China, the biggest business to business uh, commerce uh, website in the world, generating $3 billion a year, it connects over 200,000 suppliers to 48 million buyers. I mean, amazing. Talk to us a little bit about what comes next for the company. Obviously, the world is shifting under our feet here. You know, once the Olympics is over and you have to get back to your day job, what's you, what are you going to be focused on most? There are three things that we are focusing most. The first thing is about AI. So AI now is kind of a technology we believe is going to kind of shift uh, every perspective in business, especially for the global sourcing. It can solve a lot of problems from kind of language barrier to how they kind of more efficiently to run their product, run their kind of marketing. And uh, today, actually, we uh, launch a new product. This is kind of the next generation of the search engine. It's instead of kind of passive uh, kind of uh, traditional search engine, you ask keywords and then get the links. It's kind of uh, co-work with the buyers together. And since you can ask in natural language and then we can come up with result, result and the conversational kind of uh, approach, we can give you from inspirations and to the kind of specific suggestions and help you to compare among different products, among different suppliers. So you can kind of select your best partners among millions of uh, different choices. So that is for the AI part. The second part is about the digitalized, digitalized uh, supply chains. So since globalization, in the end that you need to get things done, you need to kind of pay the money and receive the product or you want to sell. So global trading has a lot of kind of moving parts and challenges from the payment to the logistics to the customer clearance after sales services. So we would like to kind of provide a service we call Alibaba Guarantee. So we will shoulder all these challenges so the buyers and the sellers, they can only focus in on their business, perfecting their products, scaling up their market. And third, but not the least, is about the globalization, the supplies. So we want to have more than 100,000 supplies actually globally in Southeast Asia, in Europe, in Latin America, in US. So when the buyers, they want to find the supplies, they can find their partners near and far to kind of fulfill their demands. So adding together these three pillars actually are the most important strategies that we're going to focusing on moving forward. Tony Parker, NBA Hall of Fame point guard, brand ambassador for Alibaba.com, four-time NBA champion with the San Antonio Spurs, and Kuo Zhang, president of Alibaba.com. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here on the Bloomberg Business of Sports. Thank you, Damien. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our thanks again to Bloomberg U.S. sports reporter Randall Williams and, of course, to Vanessa Perdomo for picking up co-hosting duties this week. And thank you for joining us. Tune in again next week for the latest on the stories moving big money in the world of sports. I'm Damien Sassauer. You've been listening to the Bloomberg Business of Sports from Bloomberg Radio around the world.